Hi everyone, and welcome to week two on historiography. Here, as usual, are our learning objectives. The historiographical origins of genocide studies are usually co-located with the biography of Raphael Lemkin, the Polish-Jewish jurist who coined the word genocide and whose tombstone declared him as the father of the Genocide Convention. You all should really be familiar with Lemkin and his story, which has evolved into a sort of hagiography, or a study of sainthood. I'll explain momentarily. But first, when Lemkin introduced the genocide keyword as part of this seminal 1944 publication, it was said to be in response to Winston Churchill's famous radio address three years earlier, which spoke of a crime without a name. According to Lemkin's self-styled account, he was the right man at the right spot in history to respond to Churchill's rhetorical exigency, or the express need for new language. In this context, it's worth highlighting the tragedy that befell Lemkin's family most of whom were killed during the Holocaust. His autobiography provides a dramatic account of his escape from the war, finding refuge in America, where he was able to use his pre-war connections and expertise in international law to gain employment in the domestic war economy. This led to his famous book and the Genocide Convention. So if you want to read the story of St. Lipkin, and I say that in jest, then check out Samantha Power's acclaimed book, A Problem from Hell which was discussed last week to illustrate the dominant narrative surrounding the genocide concept. And continuing with that discussion, the hagiography surrounding Lemkin also plays a key role in this cultural narrative, which idealizes him as a prototypical scholar-activist. This unofficial man, as he called himself, was able to leverage the numerical majority of small states and mid-level powers at the newly formed United Nations in order to fulfill his vision of changing international law. In the next slide, I'll suggest that the Genocide Convention wasn't really that revolutionary, at least not in its compromised final draft, I'd argue. Anyways, Lincoln's hagiography shouldn't obscure the underlying semantic context in which his neologism was formed. The keyword genocide didn't just appear out of nowhere. Rather, it emerged from a deeper, discursive prehistory, considering a whole range of synonyms and phrases that had long been used to characterize mass violence. Phrases like shocking the conscience of mankind have a genealogy dating to the 16th century, whereas the civilized barbaric binary, as with the Nazi barbarities, for example, as opposed to the civilized laws of mankind, all of these code words come with the baggage of 19th century colonial discourses related to abolitionism, humanitarianism, and education. Closer to the surface level of this discursive prehistory, or all of this pre existing language from which Lincoln had to choose, the invention of genocide was invested with what historians identify as the small nations ideology that sought to protect vulnerable European nationalities, especially after the Russian repression of Polish uprisings in the 19th century, or the Greek independence movement in the Ottoman Empire. This context also fostered Zionism as a national revival movement, to which Lincoln was at least briefly committed during the 1920s. Lincoln's conception of the genos, which we discussed last week to identify the targeted group, was very much conceived in this light. Lincoln's invention was also a more immediate product of an argument commonly made by various governments in exile during World War II, especially the Polish government's so-called one long chain argument, that the Nazis were committing one long, big, continuous crime that began during peacetime and which took on multiple dimensions during the war. Now, all of this is to state the obvious, perhaps. Words are invented, not discovered. This observation is often lost on educators who, in searching for a stable meaning of genocide, naturally reach towards the international recognized definition provided in the UN Genocide Convention, but almost always overlooking the hidden drafting process beneath the surface level of the text. It's like we just take for granted the definition of the final draft, as if it descended down to us from the heavens. You know, words aren't like that. They're not natural, but entirely artificial. Genocide, or at least the meaning, or to be even more precise, the meanings of genocide, socially constructed. That's really the lesson of this proposed exercise, which I guess is primarily designed for the college level, although I wouldn't want to rule out any possible adaptation for an advanced secondary level classroom. Anyways, this is an exercise in discourse analysis, which, as far as I'm using it here, studies the social life of language, how we use language in social context like the way that Lemkin's neologism drew from a pre-existing set of concepts, or how his new word fulfilled a rhetorical exigency, or as we'll briefly see with regard to the Genocide Convention, how diplomats representing the interests of powerful states 
saw the emergent campaign for criminalizing genocide as something that needed to be disciplined according to their state-centric prerogatives. The monopoly of meaning assumed by the Genocide Convention obscures its highly politicized origins. Again, we just sort of take it for granted. Language has a rather magical property like that, insofar as it constructs meaning through these invisible processes. So as I'm proposing it here, discourse analysis asks how words and grammatical devices are being used to build, construct, or assume what counts as social goods, and how to distribute these or to withhold them from listeners or others. You know, discourse is used to privilege certain viewpoints as to how such social goods are distributed. In this case, the social goods I'm referring to is the power to define, you know, the power to provide meaning through discourse. This type of discursive power works through institutions, like the United Nations, for example, which is organized hierarchically, with states having the final say as to what counts. And that is essentially how the drafting process of the Genocide Convention worked. You know, it started at the bottom of the structure and moved its way up. And as this agenda item moved up the UN bureaucratic structure, and as it got closer and closer to the state-centric prerogatives that had the final say, the definition of genocide became increasingly constricted, its meaning further and further disciplined. So the first draft that was co-authored by Lemkin and a couple of other experts in international law, they drew up a very broad and capacious definition that was whittled down over the two subsequent drafting stages. Once the diplomats took over, the definition became narrower and narrower. Here's another primary source that we can add to the discussion, which provides some important historical context. This archival document from the British Foreign Office was an internal memo discussing the ongoing negotiations over what was the first draft, the so-called Secretariat draft, the one co-authored by Lemkin, which was really broad and capacious. So if you look at the highlighted text, and a full text version of this document is available on Canvas, by the way, now you can see that this debate was really over how far to extend the definition of genocide. And the broader the definition, the more applicable it became. It might have even implicated the British government, the document suggests, considering the post-war removal of ethnic Germans, or even contemporary cases of violence in the British colonies at the time, such as in Kenya or Bangladesh, immediately after World War II. Here you see another primary source. This one is actually from the official proceedings of the UN during the very final drafting stage, when states in the General Assembly were ironing out a sufficiently disciplined definition, one which explicitly removed a provision against cultural genocide. That's what you're reading about here in the highlighted text. Basically what you have here are diplomats from Sweden and New Zealand, respectively, pointing out that if such a provision were to be included, then both they and other governments would be potentially guilty of genocide. It's the same argument against self-incrimination that we saw on the previous slide. Again, I'll share this text on Canvas, where I'll also further discuss the mechanisms of this possible exercise. But the basic idea is that we can use these documents in the classroom to historicize the Genocide Convention, to understand the conditions in which genocide was not only conceived, but also deemed to be tolerable to the powers that be. Okay, I'm going to move rather quickly through some of the following slides, as these are areas I still need to further research myself. Anyways, sticking with the same historical context, the Genocide Convention followed the Nuremberg Trials, which didn't officially use the G word per se, but which nevertheless served an important role in educating the public, and shaping public memory. It's been said that, according to one junior prosecutor at Nuremberg, the trials were the greatest history seminar ever held in the history of the world. But the lack of emphasis on the specific targeting and suffering of the Jews reflected a more general post-war amnesia. I have some more filling in to do here as well as with this point down here regarding the early presence of Holocaust education as a marginal undercurrent in American Jewish culture, as well as the post-war emergence of a new semantic field, keywords like the Holocaust, Shoah. Again, words are invented, not discovered. And these ideas that we so easily take for granted, as if they're somehow like natural elements that can be positively identified, these ideas are entirely artificial, and we can historicize their origins. So, although we're not yet doing this in our syllabus, we can historicize the post-war emergence of the Holocaust keyword. Anyways, as far as breaking through to the general public, there were a number of factors behind the gradual emergence of Holocaust memory, including some important cultural milestones in post-war American society, such as the multiple iterations of Anne Frank's diary, which received some notable acclaim. Events in Israel, first the daring capture and subsequent trial of Eichmann, as well as Egyptian President Abdel Nasser's threat to destroy Israel, all made genocide an increasingly relevant source of concern. 
Elie Wiesel emerged as a public figurehead of a diaspora of survivors who were beginning to break the silence. It was during this time as well that Theodore Adorno gave what was originally a radio talk, only eventually becoming the famous essay we read about last week, Education After Auschwitz. Anyways, there's a lot more here that I want to flesh out, and you can see some future readings that I need to further digest. But the key idea that I want to stress is that by the 1960s, Holocaust memory, and by extension the concept of genocide, was becoming increasingly relevant. Right, moving on, reading one this week suggests that the gradual emergence of Holocaust and genocide education in America must be situated in the context of a historically concurrent and contingent breakthrough in human rights as a global norm, particularly during the 1970s. For those of you interested in reading more about this, check out Samuel Moyne's 2010 book, The Last Utopia. So reading one briefly discusses a small branch of post-war social studies education concerned with raising awareness about the emergent human rights regime at the UN. Following the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights, two important international covenants were signed in the 1960s that went into force by the 1970s. So in this context, the author notes that early human rights education generally framed this as a foreign policy issue, not a domestic one. Recall my notion last week of the foreign gaze. Anyways, the election of President Jimmy Carter in 1977 was a big milestone in the human rights breakthrough. He was also responsible for the formation of the Commission on the Holocaust, chaired by none other than Elie Wiesel, who linked the moral duty to remember with the duty to respond. This eventually led to the 1993 opening of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, but I'm getting ahead of myself. It was in this context that one of our recommended readings this week locates the origins of Holocaust education in American public schools by the mid-1970s. It was an outgrowth of a short-lived movement or shift in thinking about education, a consequence of the late 1960s radical shift in values known as the affective revolution, which argued that social studies education should be relevant to the concerns of students dealing with their real social worlds. So according to the author, the extremity of the Holocaust helped teachers find a moral consensus on which to build their value-laden discussions. So the idea was to use the Holocaust to activate moral reasoning. It was also the origins for Facing History in Ourselves, which is now a major organization in the field. Since its beginnings, its dominant focus has been on individual agency, the choices of people during the Holocaust to either act or not act. This reflected a desire to mobilize the history of the Holocaust to promote upstanding behavior among students. So it was underpinned by this belief that students can find parallels between the past and present, so they could see the lessons of the Holocaust in their own social worlds. This was a synthesis of history and ethics. But not everyone agreed. Right? So reading too is a sort of backlash to this value-laden approach. Now first, for some quick context, I won't get into the author's background, but we're all students in Holocaust and Genocide Studies, and you should all be familiar with the work of Lucy Davidovitz, as well as the general principles of the uniqueness thesis. The basic idea being that the Holocaust was so extreme and unprecedented that it represented a profound civilizational rupture in the West. So this thesis is very much present in the subtext of reading one. Now for more context, another one of our recommended readings this week, it gets into this minor controversy during the Reagan years, when the Facing History program ran into critics from the conservative right who, and I'm quoting here from an enterprising master's thesis from 2019 that I'll share, said that the Facing History program delved too deeply into the personal lives of students, forcing them to document intimate feelings and beliefs that should be kept in the private sphere. I quote that to prelude our discussion next week on difficult knowledge, the psychoanalysis of repressed knowledge and whatnot. I quote that to prelude our discussion next week on difficult knowledge. And plus, this all sounds so familiar today. Critics like Phyllis Shafley were saying that the Facing History program was a form of psychological manipulation, much like critics today speak about critical race theory. More on that next week. Okay, I want to step away from our learning objectives just momentarily and talk about this slide, which is more a placeholder for something I want to talk more about in the future. This is a map of state-level mandates for Holocaust and genocide education. You know, if someone is looking for a topic for a research paper, they could do a discourse analysis of these mandates and sort of compare and contrast how they're framed. That would actually be super helpful for me. Anyways, if we come back to the basic historical narrative, these state-level mandates were occurring around the same time that comparative genocide studies was cohering as an academic field. The origins of this field date back into the 1980s, although its coherence was really pressed by the genocides in Rwanda and Bosnia that took the world by surprise. 
This reiterated the dominant rationale of using genocide studies to hopefully identify certain patterns in order to prevent future genocides. Now, even though this intellectual development was an improvement on the uniqueness thesis, it still implicitly maintained the Holocaust as the prototypical genocide. So the Holocaust became the standard by which to measure all other potential cases of genocide. And that tends to be how we approach the teaching of quote-unquote other genocides. I always use inverted commas to stress an ironic reading of that word. It's a bit dismissive or marginalizing, as if the inclusion of other genocides is tolerated only to the extent that it meets certain definitional thresholds. Now, this is where reading five comes into play. You know, and I applaud its emphasis on a global perspective to genocide education, but I really want to dig into this a bit deeper. One of the core dimensions of a global perspective is knowledge of global dynamics. And this, I think, is what's sorely lacking in the conventional approach to comparative genocide studies, as the tendency to focus in isolation on only the core or semi-core cases that make up the category of other genocides. You know, it's like missing the forest from the trees. And we fail to see the systemic forces that produce genocide. I can talk a lot more about this on the discussion forum. In contrast, I'll forego any comments about reading six, which covers the recent debate over the invocation of the concentration camp concept with regard to the migrant detention centers on the U.S.-Mexico border. Let's talk about this in the discussion forum, in the context of our discussion last week about the use of historical analogies. Okay, and I'll just wrap it up there. As usual, we have our discussion forum assignment. Also, please note in the syllabus that you need to inform me by next week of what you want to do for the final project. More on that later. Anyways, thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time.